Innovations being made in the way Italy generates power can have a huge impact on reducing emissions. I sat down earlier to discuss this with Francesco Storace, the CEO and general manager of Enel. Welcome, Mr. Storace. Thank you for joining us. You're welcome. You're welcome. Great. Well, let's it's a just... pleasure to be with you. Oh, fantastic. Uh, really appreciate it. Well, let's just jump in and, and start with the first steps that you took um, as CEO of Enel, uh, setting your sustainability strategy. And just to give some context here, you know, the energy sector is one of those sectors that is somewhat not, you know, exactly well perceived by environmentalists. It's an area of a concern. So I guess addressing those, how did you go about uh, kind of identifying various objectives? Well, basically, what I uh, what we did together with the, with the top team here is to say, you know, what kind of big mistakes did the industry do in the past, and what kind of big mistakes we want to avoid for the future. And one and the foremost is uh, mistake that we we saw was the focus of this industry on very very large projects. And by large projects, I mean projects that take more than five years to get built. And those projects are those that typically typically have the most impact on, on the environment, on, on, the, on nature, and on all things that have to do with us. And we said, let's stop doing that. Let's only focus on things that can be built in less than three years, and let's focus on those. And as a consequence of that, we ruled out a lot of um, investments that were the major uh, stumbling blocks for us. That was really that was the first starting point. One of the initiatives you undertook was to close, to shutter 23 fossil fuel plants. What led to that decision? Mm -hmm. we, we, uh, we carried out a very in-depth review of all the capacity that we have around the world. So in Italy, we found out that out of roughly 52 plants, 23 had basically no reason to exist anymore. They had either mm, a, very a very grim future in terms of competitiveness. They they, some of them were at, a, at the end of their technical life cycle and with, they are needed a lot of investment to continue to produ produce. Some of them were also at the, at the end of their emission permits. And all together, they formed uh, a big legacy of existing infrastructure that needed a continuous attention and prevented us to think about something else. So that was a, like a poison for mind, and we decided to shut them down. Well, let's talk about the good news here. Talk about some of the clean energy sources that replace that and, and how you made, came to make those decisions. Well, at the end, uh, it is not a difficult decision. If you look at the fact that in the last, say, six, seven years, <coughs> a lot of renewable energy potential uh, has become available, not because we have not found, we did not know that these uh, resources existed, but simply because the increase in performance and the decrease in unitary costs of uh, wind and solar in particular has incredibly uh, uh, increased the footprint of uh, available space for renewables. That means that plants that were not uh, competitive uh, five years ago today are competitive and Plants that today might be not competitive will be competitive in five years. So there is a wide, mo a, a largely moving uh, target of renewable development that is a function of how much technology is thrown at these uh, at these uh, energy sources, and it's paying back. I mean, the competitiveness is increasing uh, in an incredible speed. You set some fairly ambitious goals. I think no fossil fuel-based power by 2050. Talk about the journey to that and uh, what you anticipate in, as far as kind of opportunities and challenges are concerned. Well, it's simple. <clears throat> Most uh, of our uh, legacy plants uh, date back 10, 20, sometimes more years. Uh, the latest ones were built three years ago. Uh, and if we say going forward, like I, I stated before, we're, not, we're not, go not going to invest in new capacity of that kind. Uh, and we just let uh, this process of continuously revisiting our capacity roll in, roll in year after year, we will gradually and sometimes quite fast phase out existing um, fossil fuel capacity and 
substitute it with a renewable energy. We are adding about 2,000, 2,500 megawatts a year of renewable energy and closing roughly the same or somehow a lot more in depending at the beginning of this cycle. So we think that by 2030, 2035, 2040, we should be almost finished with this process, gradually facing one out and one in. Now, Enel has multinational operations in, I think, 30 countries around the world. I read a, an interesting project, 5,000 megawatts completed in Africa. Tell me about how the climate crisis has motivated you to expand your company abroad. Well, it's, the climate crisis is part of the explanation because, obviously, if you really think that uh, climate is climate change is man-induced and in wi widely dependent from greenhouse gas emission, you need to look for alternatives and you need to look for alternatives everywhere they are, they are possible. That's why you need a very large geogra geographical footprint. You need to find these energy sources and bring them to, to production wherever they abound. And, it's, it, and this is the world. You cannot say a certain area only or another not. You need to go everywhere. And that's that's for the first reason. The second reason is that the growth of electricity demand is now exploding in parts of the world where fossil fuels are not there yet. So if you're fast enough and you start feeding this big hunger with renewable energy, <coughs> you stop the growth of uh, fossil fuels from the beginning. And that's something that today we can do because, as I said before, Renewable energies are convenient, fast to the market, and extremely fragmented. So there is a multitude of opportunities that we can deploy. You've spoken a lot about the importance of digitization, a trend that's affecting every industry in the world. Talk to us how that specifically relates to energy uh, and why this is important, not just in Italy, but on a global scale. You know, if we look at a distribution network, it is typically the less considered part of a utility. The one that has attracted historically the less attention, that has had minimum management time, and it generally considered a cash cow with very little technological development. But actually, if we look at the development of renewables and an integrated um, growth of renewables across various um, phases, you reach a point where if you don't digitize and develop a distribution network at a certain level, the growth of renewables starts to stall. You reach a point where the grid cannot take more than X. And if only if you invest in digitizing the grid, you can go above this threshold. And we found this uh, to be extremely true in all times, all cases in which we have invested. Italy is the first country to be fully digitized about 15 years ago, and today in Italy we have around 12,000 megawatts at low voltage and medium voltage level that work beautifully without any problem due to the fact that we have a fully digitized network. Without it, we, shouldn't, we would not have uh, achieved this goal. So I think this is something that applies also for other parts of the world. Clean energy certainly makes sense from a technological perspective, obviously for the environment, but let's talk about the crux of the issue here, which is the economic perspective. There is this uh, false argument that reducing emissions can come at a cost to the company's bottom line, that it doesn't make sense economically. But tell us how you have found the opposite to be true. Look, <clears throat> this was an argument that had some rationale 10 years ago, when renewables started as a niche, a subsidized, heavy incentivated uh, play for technologies that were not competitive. We knew about six, seven years ago that this was going to change, and we started developing what today is the best and most diversified pipeline of renewable energy project worldwide in all technologies, betting on the fact that this industry was going to become competitive, global, and extremely quick in, in its growth. Today, this is a complete false argument. The renewable space is extremely competitive, and not only at the beginning of the, of the investment decision, but throughout the, the time in, in, the, in which the plants uh, work. Let's not forget, renewable energy is a source of energy that has a fixed 
fixed cost of production over the years, which is something that no fossil fuel plant can guarantee. So a country that invests in high percentage of renewable energies not only is wise because this is a low cost, but also is wise because it, secure, it, it gives a lot of security that this cost remains low over the years. So it's an incredible, flexible, and extremely competitive uh, source of energy today. We're almost out of time, but I did want to discuss how Enel is coming up with sustainability plans for the future, and specifically ways that you're looking to engage both suppliers and civil society around the climate crisis. Well, <coughs> we look at our work uh, in, in a way that resembles very much agriculture. Basically, when we invest in, in a new installation, uh, we invest in this installation because we want to remain in the, in the area and manage the installation and plant for 20, 30, 40 years. So we're going to be there for a long, long time. And the only way in which we can be there for a long time and, and be profitable and, and work well is that the communities that live there, that are around us, understand and share the value of this, of this investment. So there is no other alternative but to start discussing these projects very, very early in the game, explain extremely well what will be the role, the engagement, and the benefit for each community in this development. And if we have a clear understanding and a clear agreement, proceed. If we don't, don't do it and go elsewhere. So we decided that we don't want we don't want to have confrontation with uh, communities that don't understand or, or don't agree with uh, our point of view, but rather would like to have them engaged very, very early. And typically, this is a great deal for everybody. Communities grow around our installations and understand the benefit for them short term and during the day of having uh, our installations working. That's really the reason why we start so early in the discussion with them. Mr. Strachey, thank you as so much for your vision and your leadership. Thank you.